In this video, I'm pursuing to discover the way color grading has evolved in different eras and the evolution of color grading both as an art form and as a storytelling tool. This has been recorded after analyzing various films from Hollywood, behind the scenes material, online material and literature. As I examine colors and light, I have used my knowledge acquired through work experience and a color grading software. Color grading, along with set design, determines the atmosphere of a film to a large extent. In a film, one can play with colors, hide subconscious meanings, and enhance or diminish the sense of realism. Unlike in full-length movies, documentaries may receive a new perspective in the cut. With color grading, one can change the colors to a more desired effect and stir up desired feelings and depth in the film. There is no correct way to color grade visual material. Color trends and the technology to play movies may evolve, but the mood of a movie can be captured through colors. The purpose of this video is to stimulate discussion and to create a mental image of the direction visual material is going. This may also help one to create a visually pleasing color palette, no matter if it's decorating a house or color grading a movie. Cinema has its roots in photographs. Photographs are based on photosensitive chemical changes. The first photographs could not be preserved for long until it was invented in the 19th century to use silver halides in the right way. A photograph was formed when silver salts remained on the surface of the film and showed various grades of light as different shades of silver. In the late 19th century, many people began to experiment with photographs and combine images taken in a rapid series, one after the other, to create an illusion of a living picture. In that way, the horse in motion was completed in the 1878. This film was made because of a popular controversy, whether all four feet of a horse are in the air at the same time as the horse gallops. At the end of the 19th century, several short films lasting less than a minute were recorded, and as soon as in the early 20th century, it was possible to produce numerous films lasting even more than 10 minutes. Because black and white films are formed by silver salts, they do not contain colors. Only silver halides that may vary in terms of brightness. Soon, individual colors began to be painted on the surface of the black and white film with brushes. Painting black and white film with brushes was both slow and heavy. A faster and easier option, color tinting, became a common substitute for black and white. Among others, D.W. Griffith used this to help tell four different stories within a film, and this may be the first time colors were graded and used as an aid in conveying the story to the viewer. Studies show that today, half of channel surfers switch channels immediately when they see a black and white program. So we have to assume that colors have a lot to do with viewing pleasure, or at least there's great prejudice for anything black and white. The transition from black and white to color images was facilitated by the development of technology and the Oscars, which were presented to three different color films in the 1930s. It was not entirely uncomplicated, and the problems ranged from technological problems to costly circumstances and aesthetic reasons for color film. In the 1930s, an early color filming method, Technicolor, was developed, characterized by bright and vibrant colors. Back then, the colors of the film roll consisted of three colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Color determination could be done within small frames by determining, for example, the proportion of yellow dye compared to the other two colors and thus creating colors with different strengths. Some films produced by this method include Wonderland of Oz, as well as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Soon, however, Technicolor had to give way to a cheap and newer technology, Eastman Color. Developed in the 1950s, this film was a new and cheaper alternative to Technicolor. It used a simpler recording process, required less light, and reproduced colors differently than what people had been used to in the recent decades. Eastman Color became a Technicolor Oscar winner in 1952 and thus hit the nail in the Technicolor's coffin, which ceased to be used two years after the recognition. The arrival of Eastman Color contributed to the increase in color films, and eventually in 1967, virtually all full-length films were in color. The colors of the film can range from the yellow grass of Old Brother Where Art Thou to the green sky of The Matrix. 
As a result of successful color grading, the viewer accepts the colors and does not pay much attention to them, even if they differ from natural colors. The only exception is usually the skin color. If the skin color looks green or pink without justification, it can distract the viewer. Since the 1950s, Kodak has used, among the others, Shirley cards to produce the best possible colors from the color film they sell. Until 1995, the reference cards mostly contained a Caucasian woman, according to which skin color was considered. All the other colors were shaped so that the skin color could be reproduced with the most natural colors possible. Recording the so-called right skin tone is still a hot and controversial topic among professionals with digital cameras. Nowadays, colors can be easily edited on a computer with suitable programs. Programs for color correction and grading include a number of waveform monitors and diagrams that measure light in a variety of ways. These make it easier to keep colors correct and reasonable no matter what color space or gamma the media is viewed through. Prior to digital recording, colors were the sum of the strengths and weaknesses of the camera and the film stock. Additionally, artistic views such as the varying proportions of color blends, the development of film roll with different techniques, or the change of optics were able to change the visual direction of the film. Innovations to capture color via an electronic sensor are not far from how color is shot to film. Each camera manufacturer has their own recipe for how the camera records and reproduces colors. On top of that, there's always an idea of what the weaknesses and strengths for each camera model are and what their speciality is. Cohen Brothers began designing their new film shortly before the turn of the millennium. Together with the cinematographer Roger Deakins, they started pre-production and were planning the look of the film Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The, the major challenge of, of, of this picture was the final look. So we wanted it to look, you know, very dry and dusty and have a sort of feel of an old picture book. When they were talking about this picture and they were talking about this Dust Bowl era sort of look, and uh, so then became this whole issue how to alter the image enough to, to uh, get the look they wanted. Let's go in Mississippi. I said, oh, okay, well, when are you shooting? And they said, June, July. I said, well, it's going to look just like Ireland. It's not going to look like dry and brown and dusty. What happened is we started thinking, well, is di digital technology far enough along? After considering the development of digital color correction, they ended up transferring the film material to a computer and working in front of a screen. This allowed the filmmakers to manage colors more comprehensively than if they had worked exclusively with the film format. The film received a positive reception and was nominated for an Oscar for Best Screenplay and Cinematography. With a bold experiment, cinematographer Roger Deakins was nominated for an outstanding performance in film at both the Oscar Gala and the American Filmmakers Association. In order to have the control digitally, you wanted those saturated colors so you could actually select them later on in a, you know, as a digital image. These types of variations of color and, and creating of imagery has been known for years. It's just now where there's freedom to use it at the film level. A director among the first to rely on digital cameras was George Lucas. In 1999, he announced Star Wars Episode II and that it will be shot digitally. People say, why am I doing it? Say, you know, the real question is, why not? Although image quality was early HD technology, several camera manufacturers saw this as a starting point to create and experiment with digital cameras. As technology evolved, sensor sizes grew, resolution increased, and capturing digital images improved. In the transition to digitalization, previously unknown manufacturers saw an opportunity to enter the market before the major camera manufacturers had a significant advantage. And thus emerged the camera manufacturer that revolutionized the entire film industry, RED. RED Digital Cinema unveiled a 4K 35mm camera system capable of recording raw video and costing just 17500 for the body alone, they were faced with disbelief and accusation from every direction. This led to a situation where camera manufacturers were forced to research and develop competitive innovations and create a market where even middle-class people can afford to buy a camera with more versatile and reliable features than what used to be new and glamorous in Hollywood 10 years ago. 
This accessibility allows filmmakers to have greater expertise as more people can practice all sorts of things without high cost or risks. Additionally, it is becoming easier to be a self-taught filmmaker and create without a large crew, budget or production company. So, um, this took a lot more time than I initially thought. I have more material written down for a sequel to this since this was only a compact version of the first chapter in my thesis, but I guess it all depends on the pandemic and my employment. Congratulations if you made it this far and thanks for watching.